Yo, what's up, at Mine Radio listeners? This is your host, James Gesso, coming to you live, well, I, I guess pre recorded, uh, in, from London, England, where I just arrived a couple days ago. And uh, I am currently in the process of dealing with a little bit of uh, allergy, hay fever, congestion type stuff, and massive jet lag, so pardon any slurring or strange looks uh, or, or weird, gappy, distant things, but this intro won't last very long. It's just to basically let you know that, hey, I'm here, and the upcoming episode is with Sebastian Job. and before that starts, that I'm in London. Okay, right, I said that jet lag, weird thought patterns, weird speaking patterns. Anyways, so while I'm in London, I'm going to be giving a presentation called a Visionary Epigenetics, and if you are in London, uh, head to James wgesso.com uh, forward slash events and pick up tickets and come check me out. It's my first time here and I'm really excited and uh, it's a brand new workshop that I haven't shared with anybody and I'm breaking it in the London community so come check that out. Now, so this episode, Sebastian Job. Now, you're going to hear a little bit about how we met in Peru in 2014, but I got a chance to catch up with him while I was in Australia a couple months ago, I guess in March. And uh, I was in Sydney uh, doing a talk through the Sydney Spore on the four archetypes of psilocybin. And uh, him and I met up uh, in Newtown, uh, which is, a, a, I guess, a trendy suburb in Sydney. And we sat down by a, a well-graffitied wall and we did this interview. So, Sebastian, I'm just going to read his bio here. Sebastian Job received his PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Sydney for a thesis on the psychic life of Russian racist nationalism. He went on to do fieldwork in Mexico on Aztec revivalists and has since specialized in the so-called entheogens, that is, psychoactive substances which are used in a sacramental way for purposes of spiritual exploration and personal healing. <laughs> Excuse me, it's the allergies, I said. The focus of Sebastian's current research is on the socio-political significance of the entheogens. Specifically, he's looking into the use and effects of 5-MeO-DMT in its naturally occurring and synthetic forms, with a guiding interest in how this and other entheogens may help to remove the psychological obstacles standing in the way of an open struggle to outflank those who are taking the Earth into an ecological emergency. Um, Sebastian Joe, pardon that I am extremely unprofessional right now with my allergies, but apparently London uh, and my sinuses and adrenal fatigue don't all combine very nicely, pardon me. Anyways, thanks, uh, thanks for listening to this little intro or watching it on YouTube, which you might actually be doing because this is on YouTube, but the interview isn't in video, but I got a cool picture of Sebastian and I, so you should check it out anyways. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Stick around at the end because I'm going to offer you an interesting announcement that you may or may not be already familiar with. Enjoy. As you listen, keep in mind that though this podcast features medical and other professionals and regularly speaks on the topic of psychoactive substances in a positive light, nothing heard here should ever be taken as medical advice or as encouragement to consume any of the substances mentioned, especially the ones that are blatantly illegal in your country of residence. Listen critically and always check in with yourself before acting based on anything you hear or read on the internet. Sebastian, uh, 
we first met in Peru in Iquitos at a, what was the name? La Casona. La Casona mm. um, through Rack Razam. And uh, we had a pretty good conversation then. Mm. And you had been out there for a while uh, mm. studying things. What were you doing out there? Yeah, I was at, at Amaru Spirit run by Slocum Houston. And that's a place where they do a lot of plant dietas. And I think I might have just previously done a seven day tobacco dieta. Mm. And that was really transformative because I'd gone into the, I guess, the entheogenic track, on that track, primarily with personal healing in mind. You know, hit my midlife crisis, was going to go towards psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis door shut, various reasons. The same week, a shaman came to our house and I'd never met a shaman before and, I was, and he was an ayahuasquero. And so that it sort of opened me up to it. Um, and what I found, however, was that ayahuasca, both in Australia and elsewhere in Latin America, tended to take me on the more cosmic kind of journey. And I was still searching to go and do the personal stuff coming from early childhood, which I knew consciously was, was uh, holding me back. Mm -hmm. And the tobacco was really the, the one that allowed some real breakthroughs. But it had to be about seven days, and it wasn't really visionary. It was, it was more Gnostic. There's a kind of sense of knowing. I don't know if you've ever had, or if listeners would have had, Iboga or Ibogaine. But I would say in some ways, it's, it's all, I, I think of it almost as the Amazonian Ibogaine. Oh, the t like the, the tobacco. Yeah. yeah, the tobacco dieta, you're drinking the tobacco and you're snorting tobacco. Yeah. And it's obviously, it, it's, I mean, it's intense for the body, like iboga is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have, this, for most people anyway, the same kind of um, very clear voice or vision. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, grabbing the kitten by the back, the scruff of the neck and putting in its own shit and going, yeah. all right time to face this yeah and giving you fortifying you to do so which is the way i also experienced uh, iboga mm. so you initially went down to peru to do like a, a personal healing journey like a personal transformation journey but you also have um your investment your experiences with ethiogen psychedelics ayahuasca etc is also wrapped up in an academic uh, motive too, isn't it? What's Absolutely. Your, what's your academic relationship to these things? Yeah, yeah. So initially it was all about personal healing. Uh, but there was also a sense that there's something really interesting and new here, at least in terms of the encounter of Western culture, the Western psyche, with the, the plant entheogens, some animal entheogens, or psychedelics, some people would call them. Yeah. Uh, but... I come out of a, a tradition which is primarily that of anthropology and psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic anthropology. My previous work was on the unconscious motivations of racist nationalism in Russia. Wow, cool. Yeah. And I, interestingly, um, between the first and second versions of my, my PhD thesis, I was in Mexico and had a re-encounter with mushrooms and that changed my whole perspective the, the kind of philosophical grounds of the way that I thought about racist nationalism like so, so the, the re-encounter is in you had experimented with it when you were younger it's better to say I'd in my you know early days I'd had some experiences more with LSD yeah um, I think I'd never had any significant experiences with mushrooms so now I'm in my late 30s in, in that period yeah and the, again, I wasn't looking for anything in particular in relationship to my PhD, but the, the mushroom, like I was there in the cloud forests of southern Mexico, mm. and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've talked with a lot of really interesting people and they've challenged me in incredible ways, but I'm never going to be as challenged as I am by this mushroom, intellectually. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Although I haven't really followed the mushroom path. I, again, um, I've always won I've always been quite um, happy in this. Not happy. I've been interested in cultivating my sobriety as well. So I tend to have relatively infrequent visits to what some people call hyperspace, 
and then spend a fair bit of time thinking about it and you know, trying to enlarge what lived 3D so-called reality mm -hmm. means for me. Anyway, just to get back to your question about what it is that I um, have tried to pursue intellectually, I think the key thing that I got onto early on was the kind of messianic promise, especially of an ecological kind, around ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. This sort of idea that it's coming at the nick of time. You know, it's the sort of planet's immune system response, which, you know, we, which is acting on the very agent that is humanity, or capitalist technological humanity, which is so destructive now. And my background is very heavily in revolutionary politics uh, and radical philosophy, I suppose. Those are the two things that have, have really uh, structured how I've gone about living. Mm -hmm. And so I approach the plants very much in terms of, okay, well, people have been hitting their head against various brick walls, trying to work out how we can um, have better human relations, less destructive for each other and less destructive for the world, for the planet. Here's something else that people speak of as a teacher. And yet what I also saw was that, I'll tell you what, I got to Iquitos, which, you know, in, in the upper Amazon, and it's kind of known as central, you know, ayahuasca central. Right, yeah, And I went yeah. to a shamanism conference there, and I walked into the room, and I was there about 10 minutes, and I thought, it was a kind of depressive, depressive mood came over me. I thought, these people are not going to save the world. And what I mean by that is that, in a way, ayahuasca was just as much amplifying human frailty and human weakness and capacity to go off on apparently fairly weird flights of fancy reinforcing those things mm -hmm. not to mention destructive uh, like power dynamics and yeah exactly and and so Iquitos I think it's a really I've, I've ended up living there a little bit subsequently and um, I don't with this initial reaction so saying I'm not saying that I've kind of become disillusioned but I also ended up realizing that if there's one thing more powerful than ayahuasca, it's, it's the human psyche mm -hmm. and its capacity, especially the Western psyche, its capacity to profane that which could be a precious gift for it. And so it comes down to, not that there isn't a promise there, which is partly being realized that ayahuasca and other plant medicines could help a radical shift of consciousness. And along with that, a radical shift of actually human relations and actually getting down to it and changing. I think that's all going on. Um, but a lot of it depends on the intelligence of our response and how, not just, not just as individuals, but even how we speak about it and how we ritualize it, like the, exactly the set and setting that we set up. So those are the, the things I've ended up kind of exploring initially anyway, um, looking into just what kinds of changes have the plants made in people's lives. And one of the things that emerges pretty clearly is that if you kind of go looking at for the plants as agents for social transformation, um, in the hope that it'll, in a sense, give a kind of upgrade for people, you see that they actually have to spend quite a lot of time down there in the latrine, really, of their own lives, mm -hmm. working through the stuff. And it, it really does take quite a while to become even moderately competent at handling those spaces and developing a sense of responsibility when it comes to inviting other people into those spaces. And I guess it probably depends on, you know, what time frame you use to look at these things. And if you're expecting that the shift is going to happen in you know, a couple of years, you're bound to be disappointed. But if maybe, I'm hoping that if you take a broader view, that there is a really interesting fertilizing uh, 
process going on. And that that's a kind of more political, I suppose, or socio-political interest. And it connects directly to the philosophical one. So I'll just tell you a quick anecdote. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was at a festival about a year and a half ago in northern Queensland, and there was a lot of discussion about what's going on, you know, and some people had very clear ideas which were clearly opposed to other people's ideas. Some people had a sense that they, they just knew now that there, there is a kind of other species that's in control and has always been in control. And so the, it was a kind of, if you like, a really heavily fortified matrix that humans as slaves have been stuck in. Kind of like the um, like other dimensional entities. Exactly, kind of thing? exactly. Right, yeah. Yeah. And then you had other people who had, I guess you'd have to call it a much more utopian or Christ consciousness kind of strong conviction. And, and then you had other varieties and so forth. And people were arguing around the campsite these matters. And I was struck by the, once again, struck by the absolute necessity, at least as I understand it, of the capacity to sustain a philosophical reasoning discourse about these matters. What I mean by that is philosophy here as the, a kind of trust that words can express at least certain dimensions of what's really important. And they are the bridge where we kind of reach out to the other person at a certain level, not so much exactly at a heart level, but we, we keep on re-establishing this bridge to each other as people who are capable of rational self-reflection, of differentiating themselves from some really strong conviction on the basis that actually maybe there are some contradictions there. And if you don't have that, then you, you which is to say philosophy as a kind of way of transcending any given worldview, any given set of convictions in in a kind of common relationship to an ideal of truth or an ideal of accurately understanding reality, then you have a kind of reproduction of, out of this experience that you might hope would give people a new commonality, a new way of going forward, actually what you just get is a new kind of epistemic tribalism, people stuck Mm -hmm. You know, some people are very strictly scientific and they hang on to the raft of, you know, the understanding of bio biomolecular processes like rats on a, you know, rats in a storm. Mm -hmm. um, and other people just think, well, that totally misses the point. And, and I see philosophy or the philosophical urge as an attempt to try and do justice to any given perspective, but also try and find... The, find where the limitations are and where, they, where we might de develop a kind of common understanding. Mm -hmm. I, what I'm seeing in this is, a, is what I'm seeing in what you're saying is really a vitally important part is to kind of take these things, especially in entheogens like, or such as ayahuasca, we go into these places and we go through a lot of the times very challenging experiences and our perspectives mm. feel hard earned, right? And we identify with these hard earned perspectives as, as being correct and their correctness being essential to our sense of self-worth mm. or stability. And then when we go into a place and all of a sudden it's like, we're not, most of the people I've encountered, um, that are just general ayahuasca or entheogen users who aren't in that same place of, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm also in the process of like fine tuning a philosophical narrative that contributes back to the larger complex of understanding for human culture and relationship mm -hmm. with plants and society in general. They come and it's like a this religious attachment in a way. It's this very precious thing mm. and that they're not really wanting for it to get dissected or taken apart too much because it's so valuable yeah. and I think that that can create this um, this type of uh, closed mindedness to, uh, to other ideas and it can really hold back uh, the cultural narrative yeah and, and I guess I'm much of a pluralist in these matters so I think everyone ends up responding to the challenge of the plants in terms of you know if it's a positive response in terms of their strengths and 
not everybody's interested in in rational discourse beyond sort of a certain amount. Um, and I'm kind of happy that I, with that. I just I think it's it's crucial that there's a certain number of people who keep alive a kind of um, opening to reasoning without even knowing necessarily what reasoning is. You know, we can't, especially in these realms, so once you've encountered these realms, you know, what is logos? And, yeah, yeah. You know, what is information? What is intelligence? What is it to reason? Why do we want to reason? But those, then again, are kind of reasoning questions, you know? They're, they're not the same thing as making a song or, or having a precious religious truth that you're putting here, you know, only in the circle of those who will bow down to it. Right. Yeah, I think um, a term that I, I just got earlier today, actually, that I think is important, and I've been applying into my own life, and I only just got the term right, <laughs> but it's um, critical self-appraisal. Appraisal, mm. And, uh, like, really looking at what you're earning in those spaces and, and being confident in what you discover, but then also being able to take a look at what it is that you've done in comparison to other people's work and be critical in the sense of like, if that doesn't work, if that's kind of contradictory, or if it requires, I don't know, like too much closed mindedness or narrowing off or defensiveness to hold on to something, mm. um, then, uh, then there, there might be reason to look at the, like the objective or the, like the real truth behind that as maybe being in question. That being said, if you're in an environment of a bunch of people who are 100% dedicated to only the academic viewpoint and you come in with some sort of like spe seed of, of spiritual intent, you know, yeah. you might have to hold on pretty tight. Yeah, again, it's probably a matter of time and place. So hanging on to a critical perspective can be a mode of psychological defense mm -hmm. as well, you know, because critique always implies a distance which holds, in a sense, you're out of account. And you, it's a judgmental mode. I see it as, I mean, you don't necessarily want to bring that in in, in ceremony. Um, you, might, you might really want to be pursuing letting go and surrender and so forth. But then, then when it comes to contemplating the deep, capital T truths that right, you got, right, yeah. then I think it's, it seems to me crucial to, to freedom, to, to not do what so many people does seem to me want to do, which is get the big new command from Mother Ayahuasca about what they should do with their lives, which to, you know, it does seem like a sort of spiritual version of kind of infantile relationship to, you know, this big other. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't believe necessarily in Yahweh or you know the Christian God, but you know, fortunately another big parent came on the scene you know in the nick of time. Yeah, actually one of the first pieces that I wrote about ayahuasca from my my first set of experiences uh, came with a, a large disenchantment towards what I perceived as being a very um, religious cult type relationship to. The, um, to the experience and to the plant in the sense of you could pretty much take all the Christian terminology of welcoming Christ into your heart and allowing mm. Christ to show you what to do and Jesus as the as the most of, as the nourishment yada yada and just replace that with ayahuasca and all of a sudden it's legitimate but you wouldn't say that about Jesus but it's okay to say it about ayahuasca mm. and um, yeah, I found that uh, to be well, while I was in the ayahuasca experience, extremely potent <laughs> reflection and a large push to get the, if I can quote my own thought patterns at the time, was to get the fuck out of this room immediately. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, yeah, another thing that you said there I thought was important too about the critical um, mind, the critical self-appraisal, is that different modes of thought are optimal for different times, mm. and no one mode of thinking or cognition or, or uh, like mind processes is, is going to be objectively the best one for all the time, and definitely mm. when going into, like you said, going into ceremony, or for me, I would say, like, anytime you're going into a psychedelic or entheogenic experience, really the process of surrender is, is, is probably the most important one that you could have, because if you're 
if you're there to learn, I mean, in order to learn, you kind of have to, you know. Yeah, but if only you didn't control. have to do it over and over again. <laughs> right. Well, this, here's another question then, is, is you talked about there being this, um, I don't know if it was something missing, but some sort of dysfunction uh, in, uh, in the way people were using ayahuasca in the sense mm. that it wasn't actually creating a better world. The... Um, the, the messianic promise of ayahuasca as the thing that was going to radically transform mm. human civilization wasn't seeming to add up in the people that you saw utilizing it. And I'm, I'm curious what it is that you, that you came to see as, uh, and, and if, if you really were able to sort of um, uh, suss this out, but what you came to see as like the basic paradigm glitch in the way people were approaching the plant experience that prevented that uh, that actual transformation of person rather than a reinforcement of dysfunctional patterns and perceptions with the plant. I'm not sure that I would be able to zero, zero in on a glitch, um, but maybe I can kind of frame it kind of more broadly. Sure. Um, I mean, I ended up thinking that when you look at what's going to happen of the interaction of the plant entheogens more generally with the trajectory which I see as pretty dire uh, of the overall sort of civilizational project, Western civilizational global project. Do you want us to stop? Yeah, let's hang for a sec. So I asked you about whether or not you saw any like fundamental glitch in people's paradigms in relationship to the plants mm. or even to the experience that um, blocked real transformational growth and you were going to broaden it up for us. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't want to say that, that transformation is not going on. I think it definitely is for many people. Uh, but if you look at the kind of current stage that we're in, it seems to me that the plant entheogens are not only contributing to healthy growth in any in an obvious way they're also very much likely to amplify the chaos mm -hmm. the madness literally and maybe this is again a sort of necessary stage i i was saying before that i think that the the likely trajectory that we're on civilizationally the western come global civilization is towards some kind of crunch uh, there's a lot of vectors that are heading in that direction and i think that if you're thinking about glitches, one of the things that perhaps hasn't come on the agenda as strongly as it might have is how as a society or, or as a militant subculture, let's put it that way, given we can't expect society as a whole, how as a, as a militant subculture can we best address the kind of historical problems that have landed on our shoulders, mm -hmm. not just our own personal ones, and or not just sort of seeing an additive process of more and more relatively psychologically healthy people. Well, of course, that's a good thing, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily address the, the, the big issues. Um, Way of thinking about these things that I have felt could be on the agenda, and the name I give for that is stoned cyborg theory. So you, your listeners m are probably familiar with Terence McKenna's stoned ape theory, yeah, yeah. which I think, regardless of the details, is a pretty plausible uh, postulation about the way in which fungi and other entheogens might have catalyzed the shift from primate consciousness to human consciousness and then subsequently we could extend the idea to various other breaks and crises in the, the emergence of 
more complex forms of cogitation, social relationships, and so forth. And Stone cyborg theory is a kind of attempt to sort of throw that out into the future because what stoned ape theory said is there's there's a selective mechanism going on. You know, if the if the if some kind of culture of use is still retrievable for us, and it obviously has been in the last decades, it's because it was selected for in some way. It didn't get selected out, let's put it that way. Right. If we're headed towards really tough times, ecologically, socially, in terms of inequalities and so forth, with some of these things uh, increasingly uh, hitting the fan, to me there's a really significant question which we ought to be posing to ourselves, and that is, okay, it may be that at an individual level and in small communities, the plants really do help us to become healthier, more loving, um, better in some ways human beings, maybe. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be able to carry that through to for future generations. So the question would be, under what conditions, especially if the social conditions, conditions are difficult, or the ecological conditions are difficult, under what conditions would entheogenic use and knowledge continue to be socially selected for? And what choices have we got um, in the way that we use them, in the way that we speak about them, to aid the, the ongoing, um, the continuity and increase of the culture of use of these substances, if we indeed think that they are really vital mm -hmm. to human self-invention in, in a context of ecocide. So you, you, you bring up this question, which is a good one to contemplate, and I'm curious what your current perspective is on the answer to that question. Like, how do, you, how do you feel we should be going about looking at these things? Where do they fit? How do we talk about them? Yeah. yeah. Well, partly I think it's, it's shift, uh, we need a shift of demographics. So we need this, what Hegel called the silent weaving of the spirit that goes on underneath the edifice of a tottering form of life, you know. We need it so that, and I, I'm sure it's happening, so that individual groups of psychologists, in, you know, groups of philosophers, groups of engineers start having a practice. I mean, you know, not just as individuals going to Iquitos, but having circles which aren't either just subculturally ghettoized you know what is largely white middle class um, new age-ish yeah. kind of demographic we we have to help I think the the plants to make inroads and become useful for people beyond individual healing to addressing specific problems that occur within a particular disciplinary area uh, you know if you are say involved in public housing or something can you know ideally you'd get be able to get together with other public housing militants and thinkers commune work through some of your personal stuff but also have some other stuff that comes on the agenda right uh, i mean you can imagine that that going out in various ways kind of it, it brings to me the image of um of of like older tribal societies having their uh, having their going into council more so than going into ceremony, they're going into council. Right. Yeah, and it makes me think about. I believe it's Graham Hancock that made a comment that he felt like um, any political officials should be required to sit in ten ceremonies <laughs> before they can take office. So the idea of having our uh, leaders coming together and say. Uh, you know, drinking ayahuasca or doing mushroom ceremony together to really go into the thick of things and then come out and be like, so how, you know, what have you learned here about who we are and what informs our perspectives to this particular issue and how can we now come together as a group to form something that's more reflective of benefit to the whole, you know, yeah. short and long term. I, I guess the way I would see that is more in terms of the observation that's often been made that as you head towards a revolutionary situation, part of the elite splits off and, b and joins the opposition. Mm -hmm. So rather than a kind of Huxley-esque vision that the elite should become increasingly enlightened. Wait, wait, like Huxley near the end of his life or Huxley in Brave New World? Huxley near the end of his life. Yeah, like the island. Yeah, such, yeah. The, exactly. The, this sort of idea that rather than the countercultural rabble taking up these 
the acid and the mescaline. We, what we need is the most thoughtful people to steer the ship of the of the state better. And yeah, maybe there was a chance back then. I think that chance is gone. We've got severe rotting at the head, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and most, most countries that you look at. And I take that process pretty seriously, you know. Psychologically, these things are in some ways non-specific amplifiers. So if you have hypocrites like Obama or psychopaths like Trump or Tony Abbott um, taking ayahuasca, of course, you may get radical transformation and going and a really con- confrontation with the self and a decision to radically change track and, in a sense, go against what they've dedicated their lives to. But much more likely, you're, you're going to get the a reinforcement kind of, of, of like shitty behaviors based on some sort of metaphysical abstracted may, justification. Yeah, may, yeah. yeah. It, 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 they might even sort of come to embody a kind of White House brujeria, you know. Or something yeah, right. Like <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't really want to indulge in awful scenarios, but I think um, that would be where I would hope, because I do think that it's, it is filtering into the elite, particularly through Hollywood and places like that. Mm-hmm. And But what makes it really important there is the radicalization that comes rather than you know i i'm pretty convinced that we need we need and will have to get very radical political changes and inventions of new forms of being together in a non-exploitative way or or it'll just get worse and worse and i think my view is it's not like we're going to this is the dialectic really it's not like we're going to be able to sort of bring the ayahuasca etc in just in time to save us from crashing right no it won't work like that the crash will happen along hopefully you know ayahuasca etc and, and, and many other forms of social invention creativity imagination are happening as well and hopefully they will then be able to provide a healthy response to the crunch or the crunches. Mm-hmm. It's not like one big crunch. It's a whole historical epoch, um, which includes many contradictory aspects. But it's, I, I think it's utopian and in the vain sense of utopian to expect a kind of uh, intellectual shift on the part of our esteemed leaders when they are looking into the precipice. No, they're going to have to take us into the pre- over the precipice. That's when the changes, the really radical changes happen, unfortunately, but that's, I think, how it works. Right, yeah, I mean, to, to, to pick a really terrible or maybe a somewhat uh, um, uh, alternative culture quote, it makes me think of this uh, song from Deltron 3030, Hip Hop Album, and there's a line that says, crises precipitate change and so yeah i mean the idea that our our leaders which have been on a track now and are really the 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 uh the traditional holders the keepers of a paradigm that has been unfolding and taking us in a not so great direction for a long time in regards to at this point like increased um over overseeing control and increased surveillance and uh sort of increased prioritizing of economic um, progress over social stability mm. uh, that looking over this precipice like looking into like this big thing happen that they would make changes then like chances are they'll probably actually just react as like a an adrenalized reinforcement of the very same pa- paradigms that they were in but it's only when we're falling and uh, it's like things are probably going really really bad that all of a sudden it's like okay the that wasn't working now let's like everything has gone chaotic and so the clearest voice might come through hopefully it's yeah uh, i mean it's a positive voice yeah it's of course you're kind of sifting the tea leaves trying to work out what's going on i, I can only assume that there's there's some kind of again to use these sort of quasi darwinian metaphors there's some kind of selective pressures going on at elite levels that keeps reinforcing essentially suicidal behavior at the larger level so you know you go back to the end of the soviet union around 1991 
essentially Bill Clinton inherits the White House and the whole world is in the thrall of US capitalism. China is heading in that direction as well. There's only a few little sort of tin pot holdouts, some better than others. And it's squandered. The, the, the possibility for making a better a world is pretty much squandered. So you just have, you know, the kind of massive inequality that we've got now. It, it was the seeds for that were, were put there by Reagan, Thatcher, Clinton, etc. Uh, and, and for the massive despoliation of, of the, the planet, you know, the, nat the natural ecology. Um, so any of that, so Stein, Stone Cyborg theory is more like a place name, for, or like a kind of invitation for those who are already interested in the plants to, to have something else that might be worthwhile to think about. Um, because I think it's a very complex issue. But I, what I'm really putting, I mean, Cyborg is this sort of old sci-fi kind of name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to use it just as sort of an indicator for a future uh, where we don't know exactly what we are or what, we, what we're becoming. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're already, a lot of us are already <laughs> in that place of deep confusion, right? Yeah, but it maybe will become more and more technologically you know, literalized yeah. that we have these prostheses which are inbuilt and so on. But, you know, the technological takeoff is happening at the same, same time. Um, but it also has a kind of retro... Uh, ironic kind of feel to it as well. And it sounds super cyberpunk, which is really cool <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, I, I guess it's kind of more of an invitation yeah. to begin thinking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could uh, find find a closing closing comment here. Uh, I, I I feel like what I one of some of the central themes that I'm getting from this is is really a question around um, not just you know. What does entheogenic work? What do the plants mean to you? But how does this practice um, sit socially and culturally right now in regards to what type of world are we creating mm. for uh, for the people who will step into it after us based on how we're using these things and talking about these things and what kind of um, waves we're creating in the cultures around them? And uh, asking yourself, like for me, I, I often focus a lot on the, the personal work mm. of it and then I also get into the interpersonal stuff and the transpersonal aspects but this this question of not only like what does it mean to you but how um, what does it mean to you in regards to how are you changing the world how are yeah you the socio-political which is a kind of expansion of the interpersonal yeah yeah and I think it's I think it's you know it, it's very uh, it's very important that we think about it in that way because we're thinking about you know building spiritual community and creating these wonderful like ways for you know our little tribe to interact and interact and stuff. But at the same time, I mean, we should also be keeping in mind that regardless of how well we set up our little tribe with our ceremonies and all this stuff, I mean, unless we're going to run off into some sort of like transition town somewhere, we're all going to be under the increasing eye and control of a larger um, governmental political structure. Yeah, and we, we flows of refugees it. and migrants yeah. and, you know, ex exhaustion of soil and, you know, etc. Lots of things are coming at us, I think. That, um, that deserve to be seen, to be looked at and, and considered in... in in, uh, in in the same in the same bracket as how am I becoming a better person? Yeah, and if we can sort of seed these topics, it might be that people have journeys and they can bring in as part of even the kind of larger metaphysical or cosmological kind of understanding a, se a better sense of the interaction of forces of violence with forces of creativity. You know, if something, if we could imagine a situation where the plants get quote unquote selected out, it's more likely to be because some kind of quasi totalitarian regime emerges to save the people from themselves and institutes, and with new technology possibly could, institutes a kind of uh, really strict control. Well, I mean, in, in a way, that, that's, that's what was attempted in the 70s, you know, that with this like, trying to uh, push push its presence out of out of the alternative culture by 
creating these like harsh criminal mm. You know, mm. these, these like legal controls around it which I mean obviously didn't work and, and the reality is that all those things are pushing back pretty hard against them yeah but, uh, I, th I think something really interesting is happening now which is it's not only the kind of conflict between what you could roughly call kind of counterculture and the state you know, mm -hmm. the state sort of trying to police us and people slipping out between the cracks and keeping their alternative practices going it's now there's a sort of conflict emerging more obviously to consciousness between the state and capital because it's becoming clear that psychedelics have been and are in some ways conducive to greater innovation, creativity, productivity as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's you know, almost like there's a new player which is really the powerful player which is, you know, embodied, moneyed interests. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, all, that's in, definitely something to consider yeah. when the government has to start recognizing that um, it's advantageous to the country's quarterly report to have more mm. of the high-level movers and shakers in their uh, in their in the companies that are most connected to their um, economy to I mean, be experimenting with psychedelics totally yeah totally I mean and it's I think it actually does you've probably seen these articles in Forbes magazine like you know there's one who's some guy who's a billionaire who says I don't know a single billionaire that doesn't take acid and things like this, you know. Yeah, so yeah, in yeah. that whole San like Francisco, Silicon Valley exactly. is microdosing LSD. Yeah, stuff. all that stuff. Yeah. But I, I take that seriously in a sense as a sort of sign of the times yeah. that it's not it's not like capital and the state are walking in lockstep on, as on a sort of just say no track at all. Um, but I just want to say one other thing, which I think you might find interesting, is I feel that um, that. The think, thinking through the significance of the entheogens in the context of human history in the larger sphere, which is also what sort of stone cyborg theory is kind of talking about, um, is really, really crucial for us because in some ways humans are these animals that are kind of lost. Mm -hmm. And the entheogens seem to be a paradoxical thing that A, opens you to a sort of transcendent wisdom and people can genuinely feel like they've found, they, they found home. Yeah. You know, they found the true human existential home in the larger pattern of being. They, they found a visceral, uh, a, a visceral mm. entity that holds them in loving support. Yeah, or a medium. Yeah. Yeah. That, and it's very important, as you say, that it's, it's palpable, mm -hmm. it's visceral. As well as Gnostic, etc. Yeah. As in, you know, noasis, knowing. Yeah. And um, I think, on the other hand, there is, as you were saying before, there's this kind of vulnerability that maybe this is just a, a kind of, well, to put it in the strongest terms, hallucination or something like that. Right. And that's part. Of, that's a kind of split that emerges within the psyche of people who use it. They often sort of say, well, at the time, you know, it really felt like it was absolutely, I'd found it. I was there with the alchemical gold. And then outside, they might go, but as, I mean, I think McKenna said this, you know, the longer after, as the weeks go by since the last significant experience, the more kind of questions emerge around it. Uh, he actually, he has this really great story about the time that he, uh, he was coming out to try to bring this like quintessential phrase that summed it all up, the ultimate truth. <laughs> and when he finally got it out, he was like, a song is a song, <laughs> right? But yeah, there is this um, there is this sort of fading out of its of its significance, yeah. and I think that the fading out of its significance um, is really uh, it's 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 mitigated in the sense that the significance can stay with you if in that sort of um, essential time afterwards. And this is something I was talking with Jeff Baker about last night. If in that kind of really optimal time afterwards you allow the shift in perspective and dynamics that you receive in in the experience to alter your behavior and alter like and to mm. guide you in making positive changes totally. in your life that embody in, the inside yeah, yeah and then at that point it's like maybe the actual experience is sort of passed away like a dream but the the actual like the interpersonal yeah. results of it are are still present in your everyday life yeah they've got to be in some almost institutionalized objective in practice mm -hmm. yeah I totally agree with that um, 
But just to finish off, right. I guess um, I should mention that the kind of key area that I've been looking into recently is the toad venom, the 5-MeO bufotenine mm -hmm. containing toad venom. And I've ended up focusing on 5-MeO DMT because it seems to hold the, the promise to the greatest extent that I've come across of a kind of encounter with something that, that might legitimately um, count as a sort of, as the center, mm -hmm. as a real anchorage. And I've then attempted to begin to think about when did this come into human history? What were the repercussions? And well, what are the kindred experiences that have structured human history? And so therefore, how, how might we begin to think about the significance of, quote unquote, the return of a, maybe a capacity available to relatively ordinary people to get to the, the place of the eternal or I'm not going to bother qualifying the words. Sure, there are yeah, lots yeah. of other words one could use. And so I just mentioned that because with the ayahuasca, the, there's a more obvious connection to the issues of ecology insofar as people often have a sense of deep connection to the living planet and its intelligence and it, the deeper love within it and so forth. And yet that's a kind of movable feast yeah. Whereas the 5-MeO experience seems to be a source experience beyond uh, embodiment and yet extremely intense, powerful, potentially very life-changing. And in that sense, a kind of a capital T truth experience, yeah. which if we can develop ways of speaking about it again that are relatively adequate to it or more adequate to it, then that might be it may be one of the key things that the antigens can offer to an increasingly lost humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, we're in the crisis, but look, this this is this is the quintessential human experience, maybe, to go through the the eye of this. And at least the least you can say is, once you've gone through the eye of that, it's all different. Hello again. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Sebastian Job. Uh, he is like, yeah, very, very interesting guy. Uh, now, this last bit you're probably familiar with, but uh, I want to let you know that this podcast is funded by Patreon. Patreon is a, it's not really a subscription service or a crowdfunding service uh, in the sense that it's kind of both. So if you like what the podcast is all about, you can say, hey, here's a dollar or two dollars or three dollars per episode that I'd like to pay to you. You control how often you pay um, and how much you pay. And so it's totally up to you. And it is a direct line of support between yourself, the listener, and myself, the podcast creator, which helps keep this podcast going, helps me get around to uh, meet different people. And uh, Will, once I'm landed back, uh, in, uh, in Canada after this worldwide tour helped me bring the production value of the podcast to be much, much higher, which is a, a primary goal set for me. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy the uh, single episodes that are coming out now once every two weeks, um, sometimes a little bit more sparse. Uh, and uh, enjoy it for free if you don't want to give to Patreon. That's totally cool. You can like it. You can share it. You can comment on it. You can tell a friend. That goes a really long way. And like I said, you could also support it on Patreon. <laughs> Thanks again, and take care.